Uh, I will try to limit myself to 45, 50 minutes, but I could speak for two hours. And I, I hope I will be, uh, most of the time I will try to explicate myself. I will try to uh, give reasons why <laughs> did I give the, the title ridiculous master or ridiculous masters and how, what I mean by that, etc. So, uh, first of all, preliminary, I would warn you that I'm not interested here in the problem of satire, parody, lotter, or comedy that has accompanied and marked the figure of the master since antiquity. I'm more interested in the figure of the master outside these channels and genres, and I will focus here on a master as a public and political figure, or more specifically on recent changes in the way we relate to the master, and how all this may or may not relate to Hegel. You will hear me speaking about ridiculous masters, true, real true master, and absolute master. The second ones doesn't, do not exist, and the ridiculous masters basically the, the expression refers to the new masters, to the way how we somehow, uh, to the way they are strange, in a way. Uh, if I will have time, I will relate this to Cesar Milan, as uh, Aaron, Aaron already announced, uh, with his idea how the, by re-educating the most problematic members of the household, that is dogs, one is actually educating the leader, the pack leader, the humans. So uh, this is the idea put forward by Cesar Milan. And my uh, contribution has four sections, and hopefully I will finish with the first one, and then in a couple of sentences give you the idea what would be in the other three. Uh, first, I would like to make three longer remarks concerning the title and the topics I, I've chosen here. The title of my contribution, Ridiculous Master or Ridiculous Masters, is at first sight an oxymoron. It presupposes not only that the masters are morons, but also that they are so unbelievable in their preposterous absurdity that they so contradict reason, common sense, and experience that one doesn't know whether to laugh at them or to cry, to burst into tears. The new masters today appear ridiculous in two ways. Either they are unchallenged, almost absolute masters who revive all forms of despotism, or they fail completely at it. The paradox then that today's new masters are ridiculous for two completely opposite reasons. Either because they are in fact too good, because they are tyrants and despots, and strictly speaking, no longer masters, or they are, they are in fact pure substitutes for true masters, let's say. They are nothing but clowns, buffoons, idiots, nincompoop, said Rogers Waters recently. A short note uh, to the expression ridiculous. I don't know how Slovenian translators were translated, but obviously it should be smishing gospodar. I would uh, suggest that you try to translate it absurdno smiešni gospodar in the, in the, in the vein of a um, popular song uh, I heard recently, absurdno lepa, absurd, absurdly beautiful. Because the, the ridiculous has different meanings. Ridiculous can mean uh, something that is obviously cannot be true, uh, something that is so silly or foolish that one has to make fun of. It can be comic, comical, laughable, ludicrous, uh, but also, the, as, 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 it, it, as, as it is okay, I mean, as the same as the, the Latin expression satser, it means two things at the same time. What, something can be unbelievably good or unbelievably bad. So these are new, new, uh, new masters of today. They are split into the mafia-like despot who rules with a hard hand, Xi, Putin, Lukashenko, Erdogan, Orban, Modi, and the proto-fascist clown, Trump, but also Johnson, Bolsonaro, Vucic, etc., etc. Both figures appear to us, who are us, Democrats, leftists, or simply uninvolved, as ridiculous. They appear to us as unbelievably, as impossible, as parodies, farces, fakes, something that cannot possibly function normally without resorting to brute force and undemocratic measures in one case, or to obscenity, populism, and dismantling of democracy in the other. 
Many names have been proposed recently for these new phenomena. Illiberalism, Bonapartism, I would here mention Slovenian study by my former colleague Tomasz Masnak, which is very good, uh, so going from the, the middle of the 19th century up till now on Bonapartism. Uh, other proposed new despotism, John King, for instance, in his new book from 2020, speaks about uh, classical authoritarian regimes based on networks of oligarchs controlled by a democ democratically elected leader, pragmatism, money, oppression of minorities, public media, and democratic opposition. So these are propositions how we should understand uh, ridiculous masters. In any case, the very designation ridiculous master implies a difference to the master in the usual sense, to the real master, to the true master. For if the master is really a true master, he is neither funny nor ridiculous, neither idiot nor imbecile. He is to be respected, loved, revered. Sometimes he may be funny, sometimes he may be feared. Behind his back, behind the sense of publicity, he may be mocked and ridiculed, but the true master is never a ridiculous public figure. This is what we assume when we speak of a master. We expect that the master is really a true master. But the more we try to find an appropriate figure of the master in the present, the more we find that such figures do not exist today. Not anymore. One has the habit of saying that such figures are no longer produced. Of course, there is a question whether uh, they, they, they have ever existed. Or, or they, was, there every, was there really ever a true master? But I leave that aside. For the purposes of my exposition, I'm talking about true master, and hopefully we will understand each other. And uh, in a way, the very name the, the, we, we are trying to describe these masters, the ridiculous masters, points into the direction which uh, goes uh, connecting master with the surplus and excess. And yes, of course, master belongs together with certain excess and certain surplus, but I don't have uh, time to develop it here today. Let me here uh, point out in passing that the nature of these questions I've just put out somehow uh, overlap uh, with the questions that have existed for a long time. First, there's the problem of the present. Remember how Mallarmé said, the present is missing. Today is not, nothing has taken place. Then there is the problem of fake. We often say that we live in the age of fake news and simulations, and now we have fake masters. We are dealing here with a team that by Alain Badiou was placed at the center of the 20th century. In his work, the century, Badiou speaks of the passion for the real and in its dialectic with semblance and fiction. Of course, it is Lacan who speaks about the real and the semblance too. All these themes and problems form the background against which the question of the master arises today. At its core, of course, there is also a problem of nostalgia linked to an and embedded in the thesis that we live today in an era of various post-isms, post-modernism, post-catastrophe era, post-political era, post-ideological era, and now in the era of post and fake masters. That's why I propose a thesis that we live now in the era of the ridiculous master. The master, especially in his political version, is today uh, universally and consensually hated, despised, and ridiculous figure. In fact, no one wants to be a master. In the workplace, our bosses want to be our friends, as Boltanski and Capella showed in their, in their work, New Spirit of Capitalism. Elsewhere, they want to be our colleagues, peers, brothers and sisters. In politics, they are managers, crisis managers. In populism, they are leaders. That is, outsiders who emphatically distance themselves from the establishment and fight the real absolute masters, that is, the elites. Anti-politics is on the rise, we are used to say, and this is the age of anti-isms, against ism, etc., etc. And at the center, I, it seems to me, is the figure of the master. We all make fun of masters, we are all against domination in all its forms and against masters of all kinds. Those who hold offices, posts, and leadership who are in position of authority, as we say, 
often ridicule and make fun of themselves, which is socially accepted and expected of anyone who holds such a position. Those who take their role too seriously are immediately labeled as wannabe masters, tyrants, and despots who seek power and totalitarianism. Today, masters are considered as either incompetent or too competent in a way, too powerful. And that's our predicament. There is never a true golden Aristotelian, golden mean in an Aristotelian sense with a master. On closer examination, it turns out that this is just not our contemporary dilemma or predicament. In a sense, the starting point of any approach to the master is precisely the loss of his supposed authority and ridiculous masters are masters without authority. Let me refer here to a well-known starting claim on, the piece by, uh, on, on authority by Hannah Arendt. Quote, in order to avoid misunderstanding, it might have been wiser to ask in the title, what was and not what is authority? For it is my contention that we are tempted and entitled to raise this question because authority has vanished from the modern world. End of a quote. That's uh, Arendt between past and future. The reasons why Arendt comes to these conclusions are, of course, specific and do not really interest us here. It is true that Arendt speaks of authority and not of the master in strict sense, but there is no master without authority of some kind. If we agree with Arendt that authority has vanished and disappeared, then we are living in the age of the masters without authority, i.e., ridiculous masters. But if they are masters, then they must have some kind of authority except that is, that is perhaps different and functions differently than Arendt suppose it should function. I mean, there are several other theoreticians, for instance, Lacan, when he says the big other doesn't exist, but none at less has its effect, etc., etc. And there are other uh, lamentations, complaints, how our civilization is on the brink of uh, decline, etc., etc., etc. However, from ancient times since Plato, everybody is complaining how things are not anymore how they used to be, but we are still existing as a civilization. It is true, we are in a serious crisis at the moment, as uh, Vara has shown really well. We are on the brink of ecological crisis, on the brink of the Third World War, etc., etc. Agamben uh, proposed the thesis that the global civil war has uh, began long time ago, etc., etc. And the Marxists talk about history as a history of class struggle, etc. But despite the fact that the world is full of disorder, it is not without masters. Perhaps precisely because of what has just been described, one wishes that a real master would finally appear and restore order. On the other hand, there will be no serious change without the renewal of emancipatory politics, and this cannot take place without professional leadership, EAE, with some kind of a master. So, there are some structural dilemmas and problems with the master. And I'm attacking this question with various, from various sides, and perhaps I am repeating myself, so excuse me, but we were... Well, uh, uh, <laughs> That's it. <laughs> um, I just quoted Arndt, and uh, I would, however, submit that somehow she's pointing us in the right direction. Uh, it seems that the ultimate zero point of any authority and authority of a master is, uh, is in fact built from the beginning on a loss, failure, even on impossibility and nostalgia. Once upon a time, sometime in the past, there was authority, there were true masters. Those were the times, those were the true masters, etc. The criterion what a master is and what it, it should be is somehow submerged in the mystic, mythical mist of the past. The appearance that what we have today, regardless of the time in which this statement is made, are only imitations and copies is necessary and abolishable when speaking about master. On the one hand, because new masters, precisely because they are new, are measured by the standards of past masters. New masters either promise to finally restore the glory of past masters and renew the figure of the master, or they fail to do so and are nothing more than a car caricature, farce, burlesque, travesty, etc. On the other hand, it is necessary to include this additional point, mediation, without which authority as such cannot function. 
authority and therefore master is something mediated, connected with a kind of reflection. No one can declare himself an authority or a master. The others will make him one. Others will treat him as a master. And I would quote a well-known uh, passage from Marx's Capital Volume 1, quote, such expressions of relations in general called by Hegel reflects categories form a very curious class. For instance, one man is king only because other men stand in the relation of subjects to him. They, on the contrary, imagine that they are subject because he is a king. So a master is a master because others treat him as such. However, something needs to be added to explain how such a behavior works. We need to introduce what I will call here a mythical point that does, that does not exist in reality. In one of his texts, Benjamin Noyes develops the thesis that authority is always outsourced. But this outsourcing of authority and the need for it has to be defined, in my opinion, more precisely. And I propose here the concept of interpassivity elaborated by Zizek and Robert Faller, which showed that belief cannot be directly referred to itself. You always need a hypothesis about a naive believer who is sincerely and naively believes that we too could believe. So that's this mythical point that, any, that, that, that is needed if we want to have a master. This element, I, I call it mythical, is the basis of every authority and also every master. And now the difficult question is why does that, that, that does not function today or that, that doesn't function as it should be? I don't have a really uh, successful uh, answer. But one of the reasons is certainly, one, that we no longer believe in naive believers. We simply cannot believe, not anymore, in naive believers. No one wants to be today a loser or a sucker. And that has some consequences for this mythical point. To believe that someone could believe in the past, blindly and naively, is simply too ridiculous for us. And that's the problem. But this, this is not the whole explanation, because in a way, if you take conspiracy theories, they believe even, I don't know, there are no proportions how, how, function, how uh, conspiracy theories function today. And uh, many enterprises have, have insisted that uh, being a part of, consp of believers in conspiracy theory is uh, some kind of... Uh, uh, it's, it, has, it has its binding factor. It's, it connects people together with equal uh, or, or similar thinking, etc., etc. But I think we should include also this mythical reference as well. Uh, once I am in a, such a community of believers, they are there. You know, they, I can discuss with them. They are they are present. So I can also believe in most ridiculous plots imaginable. And. Uh, of course, I'm not the first one to, to raise this question. Remember Vernon's book, Did Greeks Believe in Their Myths, etc., etc. So this question has uh, its history, and I don't have time to develop it here. So there are three points one should point out, three consequences regarding the master. The first is this mythical point, but mythical should be understood in the narrower and the wider sense. In the narrower sense, it's the point that I already described. It's, roughly speaking, the mention of the myth. But in the broader sense, one would have to include also everything that had been said about fame, glory, mana, charisma, etc. And it all depends on how a new master implements that, how he or she relates to it, handles it, manages it to, it, to, to use Santner's term of mana jurism. Second point, it seems that the figure of the master is structurally always connected with some kind of repetition. The master repeats, he refers directly or indirectly to past masters, to the way they did it. Recall the Marx appropriation of Hegel in the first lines of 18 Brimer. Hegel remarks somewhere that all great historical facts and personalities occur as it were twice. He forgot to add the first time as tragedy, etc., the second time as farce. We could rephrase this. Hegel remarks somewhere that all masters, in politics at least, must, so to speak, appear twice. He forgot to add that it depends on the nature of their appearance and the way how they act, 
whether they, they appear as tragedy or as farce. Um, I also mentioned Bonapartism. Bonapartism is not just a case, one case among others. It was the first case of new masters. It was the, the first modern coup d'etat. And uh, Marx presented a brilliant analysis. And as I already said, this analysis uh, has its history uh, since Gramsci, analysis of fascism, etc., etc. But I leave it here. This is not the only reference the new master can have to the past. The new master can refer to past master directly or indirectly in various ways. It is true that he is always judged against the background of the past, for better or for worse. Whether he likes it or not, he is always perceived against the background of the actions, deeds, and gestures of the past masters. The direct way already mentioned means that he consciously and intentionally camouflages himself with the masks of the past. But he can use many other, more indirect ways of nostalgia, recall thousand years Reich or MAGA, make America great again. And this is true also for the left. Remember that Benjamin spoke about messianic appropriation of four past revolutions. So this goes in reverse too. And in a way, if we're talking about repetition, we can talk about repetition in its negative form. After the Second World War, a master has been seen as a refugee and a remedy for terrible past times. Never again. The call of the era after the Holocaust, after the Second World War, after the Hiroshima and Nagasaki is actually repetition in its negated form. We don't want to repeat this history again, it was said. In a way, New masters are always measured on the background of the past masters, also in critical theory. And in critical theory, the emergence of a new master is often and hastily reduced to already known forms of the past. The task is to prevent an, the analyzed phenomena from reappearing, from repeating themselves, from bad things to happen. Aha, they say, this is a case of fascism. And this kind of analysis can lead to ridicule and scorn, but its goal is primarily to mobilize in the face of an imminent danger. But sometimes it works, most of the time it does not. It not only prevents a more thorough analysis of new phenomena, but often mobilizes strong emotions and passions who prevent uh, real structural analysis. Combined with sterile political correctness, it prepares the ground for what is supposed to prevent, namely the rise of the extreme politics. And if we add to that what today Troja, my colleague, called the extreme political center, when the center constantly makes concessions to the extreme right and it leans further and further to the right, we get the picture in which ridiculous master regularly appeal. And my third point uh, is that in order to function, master has to use Slavoj's uh, famous phrase, tarry with the real. With the real in the Lacanian sense, not just impossibility, impasse, but also uh, things that belong to the register of the real, enjoyment, drives, etc. In that way, we are coming to the point that uh, a master must confront and persevere with the fact that its own status, its task and mission of coming to power and staying in power is, on one side, precarious, delicate, problematic, and considered impossible. So a master must play creatively, if I can say so, with the fact that governing is, and ruling, as Freud put it, impossible profession, perhaps with a twist or two. As Paul Valéry said, every ruler or master knows how Fragile, fragile the authority of rulers is, except his own. Each master believes he is an exception to this general rule. Each offers himself as a cure and remedy for this fundamental impossibility. Each has the illusion that he will be the exception, the only one, the one. The consequence of this is that the impossibility associated with the master has its flip side. We have never done away with the master. We are always in some relationship of domination, of mastery. And here's the paradox. The master as a function is at the same time very fragile, precarious, and, and yet indestructible. 
One can say that the master is a bone in the throat of, throat of Aufhebung. That's a, good, that's a good slogan for a conference. Master as a, as a bone in the throat of Aufhebung. We abolish one master after another, and yet the figure of the master himself seems to be indestructible. He is, as Alenka put it in one of her books, the odd one in, to, to, to put that phrase. We are, everyone is against the master, and yet, he is always there. He reappears again and again. So, ridiculous master must be seen on the background of past masters and on the background of the failure of past masters. This is the starting point of new masters. The new master promises to restore order where there was chaos, disorder, confusion, stagnation, blockage, impotence. Where there was chaos, a master shall become, to quote Freud's famous dictum, wo chaos war soll her werden, if I may use it. So, when Arendt asks in the introduction to, to her paper about uh, temporality, about uh, what was the master, the past tense, uh, she is pointing us in the right direction. And I would say that master somehow is in a, very special limbo time, all the time moving around, always, always uh, escaping, and uh, you can never point it out properly. Okay. Ten minutes, and then I will speed up, okay? Okay. So, in order to become a master at all, a master cannot address his goal too directly. If the direct goal of becoming a master is too obvious, it will soon be exposed as too desperate and too ridiculous. So, the goal of becoming a master and staying in power must take a long and winding road, if I can quote the Beatles. Although many masters are robust bullies, being a master requires a tact. Coupled, of course, with burst of self-aggrandissement. And we were talking already about Trump this morning, and Eric said that uh, Trump described himself as a very stable genius. And this is the ABC of political propaganda put so nicely by Victor Klemper and his lingua terti imperi. I mean, using, constantly resorting to superlatives for the first time in the nation's history, never before in the history of the mankind, etc., etc. So, these exaggerations, which are part of political propaganda, are crucial for modern brand selling and marketing of celebrity fame and making modern new masters. The fact is that all this self-aggrandissement does not work. And, in fact, master is... Uh, powerful, and yet he is powerless when it comes to the, the object of love and transference. And there is no master without love and transference. As we all know, love is a matter of uh, chance, a chance encounter they may, that may or may not occur. And in that way, a uh, master is a subject that this click, that this sudden uh, reversal takes place or it, it doesn't. If this uh, reversal is somehow stuck in the middle, then we get ridiculous masters. Then we get this. We, we, we can use them in a, in a uh, we, we, we can see them in, in their, uh, their um, ridiculous light, whatever that means. So the master is in the eye of the beholder and uh, uh, that means that he is master for some, and he is not master for the others. So these are three, three uh, elements uh, that I wanted to point out, meet repetition and impossibility, and, uh, and uh, this is, it seems to me important to point it out, especially regarding the ridiculous masters who are despised, despised and yet we cannot get rid of them. And in that way, <laughs> we have a strange uh, reversal of Hegelian and Wagnerian slogan that Zizek so uh, tirelessly repeats. One master another, 
should be put in the context, the wound is healed only by the spear that struck or smote you. So we have, we have also uh, a case when a new master uh, appears in the name of defeating the supposedly absolute master. Now we come to the uh, absolute master, which I think that conspiracy theories are really the true fans of uh, absolute master. Uh, the critical theory always says there's no master, there's no absolute master. And yet we see by the, uh, by the recent proliferation of uh, conspiracy theories that there are many believers in the absolute master. So, um, and here we are, so here we are in our uh, Current predicament is that truth and reality are strange and in fiction, or as Andrew said it, uh, considering history, it <laughs> that it is strangely comic but deeply dangerous, and that's that's the definition of our uh, that's uh, definition of our moment, and that's the definition, in fact, of the 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 way how ridiculous masters work. They work. In many ways, I, I've already mentioned superlative, but I, I shouldn't forget what I would call fake diminutive. So, fake diminutive, which is quite common, and uh, one can pretend to be a master in order to fight an absolute, a real master, in the name of urgent and necessary final defeat of the master who pulls the strings from behind. Jewish conspiracy in nazism, deep state in populism, remnants of the communist regimes in the new democracies to this, etc., etc. And the message is here, no, 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 I'm not the absolute master. He has yet to be defeated. And uh, as uh, Aaron has showed them uh, very uh, convincingly, uh, defeat is not the same as humiliation. That's a crucial thing, and, but, but we don't have time to discuss it here. So, uh, ten minutes. Okay. So I come to the section two, and now we are shifting to the sixth gear. Um, what I would like to point out is the context in which the question of the ridiculous masters arise, arises for the first time. And this context, uh, which is not mentioned by Arendt or anybody else, is of course Hegel. And this was pointed out by Lacan in his uh, Ethics, of, Ethics of Psychoanalysis. The history, says Lacan, is thus for Hegel defined, quote, in terms of a radical decline of the function of the master, a function that obviously governs all Aristotle's thought and determines its persistence over the centuries. It is in Hegel that we find expressed an extreme devalorization of the position of the master, since Hegel turns him into the great, great dupe, the magnificent cuckold of historical development, given that the virtue of progress passes by the way of the vanquished, which is to say of the slave and his work. Uh, many things had been said this morning uh, about uh, that, uh, but I would point out somehow uh, Hegel's and Lacan's optimism and yet realism, if I may say so. So, uh, the way how this uh, short passage functioned throughout the history, we, we, we know the, the the study by uh, Judy Butler, subject of desire, etc., etc., has its uh, has its own fate and history. And uh, Hegel's optimism is that the master has won, but he will be defeated in the end, whatever that means. He will be defeated, and this is Hegel who opens champagne every 14th July, etc., etc. So we are here, Hegel the revolutionary. And this is Hegel who somehow limits the power of the monarch in his philosophy of right, uh, as this morning was already pointed out by Gregor. But, and this is he Hegel who speaks about the role of the historical, uh, world historical individual, as Andrew has shown, etc. So there are many phantasmagorias, and I, wouldn't, I, I would not want to enter in the topics, but I would just point out the following. I think, yes, it's true, Hegel limits somehow monarch. But in the final analysis, he is well aware that we cannot do without monarch. And he's what, in my opinion, means that we cannot do without master. 
And in, in the 318th paragraph of Philosophy of Right edition, Hegel is putting, uh, he's putting a situation when a monarch decides. And I, I, I suppose you all know the anecdote uh, that Friedrich uh, William III uh, supposedly replied uh, when he was facing, uh, somebody presented him the, the role of the monarch, dotting the I, just giving his signature, etc. And supposedly the monarch said, and what if the monarch doesn't want to do it? What if the monarch doesn't want to be the reason? Uh, but in Hegel, we already have the provision of this situation, and now I'm quoting this, uh, this passage, and I don't have time to comment it. In public opinion, all is false and true, but to find out the truth in it is the affair of the great man. He who tells the time what it wills and means, and then brings it to completion, is the great man of the time. In his act, the inner significance and essence of the time is actualized. Who does not learn to despise public opinion, mm, which is one thing in one place and another in another, will never produce anything great. So, let's leave it. But in my opinion, that means that in a way we cannot do without a master for Hegel. He limits master. He's not in favor of masters or whatever, but somehow limits it, because Hegel knows that the master will rise again like a phoenix from the ashes. That's the point. I've already, I prepared so four notes on the master-slave dialectic, which I'll pass by. Uh, Lacan, in three sentences. Um, one might conclude from the passage I quoted from the Ethics that Lacan somehow fell for the trick of Coget's simplistic reading of the master servant dialectic. I agree with the uh, interpretation backed and uh, developed by Mladen Dular that Lacan's Hegel is Coget's Hegel. But the same uh, Mladen Dular also showed that in Lacan's 17th seminar, Lacan uh, does not know what to do with Hegel. Hegel is now the most sublime hysteric, then he's uh, the pure representative universe of university discourse, then as a philosopher, his master, etc., etc. So Lacan is struggling with Hegel, but he's very critical and sharp towards Hegel, and uh, in his decree, uh, page 686, he's referring to the the outcome of the dialectics of uh, master and slave with, uh, with the following. There can be no more obvious lure than this politically or philosophically. Jouissance comes easily to the slave and it leaves work in serfdom. So, uh, I think that somehow Lacan shares Hegel optimism considering the master. Uh, because in Lacan's theory, master is nothing but the effect of the structural place. He's nothing than a function. Moreover, master is something who is hysterized. It is put in the position of the hysterics. Uh, the, uh, so, uh, and Lacan would also insist that uh, there is no absolute master, and the master is dupe on every occasion. However, I think that uh, Lacan's uh, proviso or, or, or insistence is that we should not be duped by the master's supposed dupery. So, considering the ridiculous masters, we should not forget that they are masters. And what is the the role, the function of the master, very shortly in Lacan. Uh, he says, master gives a sign, the master signifies, and everybody jumps. Master doesn't desire to know anything at all. He desires that things work. And in seminar on ethics, he's referring to uh, Alexander, Hitler, and whatever were the new liberators, and he says, the preamble isn't important. I have to come to liberate you from this or that. The essential point is carry on working. The work must go on. The show must go on. That's the point of the master. So in a way, uh, 
We can say that Lacan shares Hegel's optimism. Okay, master is a dupe, etc. He is against master, etc. But in the end, uh, he knows that the role of the master is that the, the work continues, that uh, capitalist way of production commodities continues, if you will, that the valorization process continues. Uh, I'm leaving aside many things. Uh, Lacan divides the history of the master interestingly in three phases. Aristotle, Hegel, Bentham. As you see, I, I, I'm proceeding in verse. I started somehow with, now with, with Bentham, went to Hegel, and now three sentences about Aristotle. I, uh, I was planning to present you here the case of uh, Doc Trainer, Cesar Milan, which, who is very, um, it, it's a success story. And uh, the nomen is Tomen, Caesar, Caesar, that, that's the real definition. I will just read you the, the introduction of himself on his website, so, so you can make fun something, yeah. yeah. Caesar says, my origin story. Caesar Milan, born Cesar Felipe Milan Favela on August 27, 1969, is a Mexican-American dog behaviorist. He is best known for his television series Dog Whisperer with Caesar Milan, which is broadcast in more than 100 countries worldwide. Prior to the Dog Whisperer series, Milan focused on rehabilitating severely aggressive dogs and founded the Dog Psychology Center in East Los Angeles, which later moved to its permanent location in Santa Clarita, California. With more than 25 years of experience, world-renowned dog behavior expert and New York Times best-selling author Milan is one of the most sought-after authorities on dog behavior and rehabilitation. In addition to being a New York Times best-selling author and world-renowned speaker, Milan is internationally acclaimed star of several successful series and entrepreneur with an innovative line of products under the Cesar Milan brand. That's it. That's how somebody presents himself. I'm not saying that Cesar Milan is a bad guy. I'm not. He's very sympathetic. He treats animals good. He has slogans, better human, better dog, better environment. Uh, and uh, Aaron put uh, the background of uh, the, our relation to dogs, etc. My thesis is that somehow we have here a master of the households in the Aristotelian sense. As you know, Aristotle was a chauvinistic patriar patriarchal pig, and for him uh, the division between man and wife is very strict, uh, and Caesar is not so. In Caesar's uh, shows there, there's everybody, there are lesbians, gays, whatever, whatever. This is a mo modern approach. However, a couple of years ago, uh, there, there has been an affair, and it was shown that Caesar is using illegal methods, electroshocks, to train dogs, which I don't find uh, personally it happens. But, uh, yes, but uh, this shows us that you cannot be a whisperer to a master. You, you cannot be master whisperer, dog whisperer. I mean, to being a master, uh, relies on a force, brute force, and physical force. And that's how masters may seem ridiculous, but they are still masters. And uh, one thing we don't have in Caesar, leaving aside all the affairs and every, everything that's problematic, it's, uh, this is a very modern approach. You know, We have households, we have bubbles in Sloterdijk's term, you have, and then, you don't know how these bubbles will, in the future, or in the present society, will communicate, and who will decide. And, uh, that's the same problem as it was one of the uh, criticisms of Hegel. But leave, leave that aside. So I finished <laughs> punctly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for this um, really inspired talk, which kind of brought in many, many, many different aspects of the master. Uh, and I'm sure there will be a lot of questions. If I may just um, begin by something, it's a kind of, if I understood correctly um, the beginning of, let's say, the third movement of your talk, <laughs> when we introdu you introduced this possibility that, uh, first of all, the thesis that, okay, we are still uh, up to our 
hats in the master discourse in some way. Yes. Uh, but then the, there is this idea of how to minimalize it in, in Hegel and how to, uh, it will end. But so, uh, is, was there this idea, which I think it's kind of really interesting and perhaps relates a little bit to also what Barra was saying, namely that perhaps we should put an end to trying to put an end to the master <laughs> and this is I mean that we are trapped into this uh, absolutely, master absolutely. discourse precisely through this criticism through this constatations of uh, but at the same time that the idea of the master is somehow still captivating us in a way that precisely and so that there is perhaps this move that just uh, um, kill um, and, and the end, or uh, end the end of the master, and perhaps <laughs> this could. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, I, fully, be, I fully, I fully agree. I fully, I fully agree. The, the main, the main part of my uh, presentation was uh, somehow a warning, if I may say so. But there's, there's always a problem of warning. You know, we are warned all the time. We are mm. warned against, you know, the pop, pop, uh, populisms who, who might come to power, etc., etc. And this is somehow embedded in the politics of fear and people are all already tired. And that's a nice suggestion. Putting an end, an end to that ending would be a uh, move in the right direction. I, I, I completely agree with you. And uh, in one of his texts, uh, I mean, uh, Aaron Schuster on impossible professions uh, presented the way how he understands psychoanalysis as a way how mm. to dismantling the master's discourse from inside. Mm. And uh, in, in that way, I, 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 I hope I wasn't, wasn't uh, understood that I'm somehow pessimistically saying, well, the master will, will be here, so let's... No, but let's I, I think you very, made this point very well, yeah. that they are here precisely by our constatating both that they are no longer here or that they are not as they are yeah. supposed to be, yeah. and by some people, I don't know, still preciously believing in them. Okay, anyway, Thank I you. want to observe. observe. Oh. Please, Gregor. Um, so, yeah, I just grabbed the microphone. Um, I have a critique. Dogs. And, okay, yes, on dogs, of course. And uh, I have a, a comment slash question. So I've recently purchased a dog, so I'm, a, I'm brainwashed and everything. So, uh, and it's a personal problem of mine, of course. I acknowledge that. Uh, but yes, I cannot agree that, you know, Hitting was, dogs is it was just, it, it was yeah, it just was a mistake. It was a, yes, I, I'm it was a bad joke. You should be sorry. <laughs> exactly. Um, so that's the critique. Uh, I had weird comments on the name Caesar because that's usually a dog's name, and why would a dog? Well, never mind. Never mind. Uh, so the question comment. Um, you mentioned at some point the question of uh, ridiculousness in some sense pertaining to the concept of the master. So somehow beyond, you know, beyond whether we're talking about kings or Caesar or Caesar yeah. Milan, <laughs> obviously yeah. we see the ridiculousness there, but also, also someone like Hitler or whoever. Um, and this is something I, I read in uh, Anka Parvolescu's book, actually. Um, Franz Kafka, I think, has this wonderful story about meeting the president of the bank or the financial institution of his, and that the president had a very presidential speech and he just had to laugh himself out of the room because he couldn't stand it. Um, anyway, so there is, I think, this dimension. Uh, and I'd like to enforce and underline this uh, this thought that you pursued but didn't really had a chance to, to evolve. No, like, no, no. There is the, probably yeah. something generally theatrical or ridiculous or... Can you elaborate on that? I mean, how would you describe this category if someone asked you a question to as, elaborate? As I said, I was just somehow uh, deliberately limiting these questions, knowing that the, it exists, and I completely agree with you that there's a, the problem with the trialcy of power, of course. Uh, but somehow the leftist in me <laughs> is not satisfied with that, you know. Uh, because I think that uh, laughing helps, but it doesn't solve the problem. That, that, that's my opinion. Uh, we have to take seriously, because th this, uh, these guys are in, in the position of authority. And, uh, and I, uh, I mean, I'm leaving aside the satire, the lotter, everything that Hanka wrote book on. Uh, here, purposely limiting myself on this... Uh, Warning site. So 
They are. They are in a position of power. They might be funny. They might be ludicrous. They might be ridiculous, which is not funny. And uh, yeah. Uh. Yeah, there are, uh, I see three hands. I think, uh, yeah, Eric. Um, it's wonderful. And um, I'm wondering, it seems that in all the talks about the master have been about <clears throat> political masters, political leaders. Yeah. And I'm, but clearly the word is, we use the word in many other ways, in many yes. other contexts. Yes. And I'm wondering if there's something to learn about the political master and our relationship to the political master by thinking about our relations to other kinds of masters, like master theorists. I mean, if you, you know, like, and couldn't one say Lacan was a kind of ridiculous master in he some was. ways, you know, grotesquely theatrical, um, enigmatic, you know, um, and, and, and yet, you know, to, in a certain sense, to become a Lacanian, you have to, in some sense, be taken in, and yet not taken in. You know, so there's something about our relationship to, let's say, the authority of authors. You have to enter into a transferential relation, or else you can't learn anything. So there's something about pedagogy and learning, experience, mm. erfahrung, um, that requires, you know, <laughs> a kind of apprenticeship. Now, of course, when, you know, not the television show, The Apprentice. You know, remember, Trump had a television show called The Apprentice. Um, so he was the ostensible master. But there's something about, you know, the need to apprentice oneself yeah, to I a agree. master or yeah. to trust the author. And, um, which doesn't mean the narrator, but the, so there's something that we're, all of us are engaged in all the time that actually also enables us to generate these critiques of the ridiculous master. And so we depend on, so I'm wondering about our own split relationship, you know, that we're inhabiting here in all the, you know, Hale, Lacan, Marx, the constant, you know, um, citation of authorities. Um, as if the name somehow gave a kind of guarantee um, to the um, to the effectivity of the force of the thought. Anyway, just yeah, I agree with you completely. And this is I, I recall that what you once said that you have to uh, encounter the master in order to be a philosopher. So, and it's not just for philosophy; it's for everything. So the first step is to encounter a master and to somehow fell, fell in love with him. And then from inside, you realize how the, the vagaries or, or long and winding roads uh, of your attachments to a master fully agree. Uh, but I was pur purposely uh, focused on the political master because I know there might be no. some other. And, uh, and one of my footnotes preparing for uh, uh, comments on the dialectics of master and slave in Hegel, uh, perhaps it is less known that uh, Kozhev uh, in, uh, later developed four types of, of a master, a leader, master, etc. Et so he was well aware that the, the figure of the master presented in phenomenology does not suffice. Even more, he somehow Maybe it's preposterous to say that, but he somehow went in the same direction as Lacan later with the discourses, four discourses, because he was well aware that the, the discourse as such, concrete discourse, is never just master. It's a combination of master, leader, etc., etc. So he combined and he get he got uh, 64 combinations, etc., etc. So this is already formalization taking place, which goes in the direction of Lacan. So uh, yeah. Thank you. Yuval, yeah, please. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, it, was, it was great. I'm also obsessed with similar themes. Um, I want to make two remarks. OK. Um, the first would be this. In some way, the idea that, um, you know, that is part of our cynical wisdom somehow, part of your talk as well, that there are no true masters. Yeah is what makes such a ridiculous master not so ridiculous. Absolutely. Which is to say, to quote one of my favorite political philosophers, Sarah Palin, 
we are presented with the, the option between a pig with lipstick and a pig without a lipstick. And then I would choose the pig without the lipstick. And, and it's, important, uh, it's important to put, I think, ourselves in the position where they are not so ridiculous. I mean, it's important to see the way, you know, not to put uh, an idiot between us and the mm -hmm. ridiculous mm -hmm. leader. There is an effect there that is appealing in some way, even if we don't like to admit it, or at least it works against something uh, which we all share. That would be my first point. Okay. The second point is, um, and, and I'm, I know I'm dragging this back very much to, towards the political, is, you know, you talked about this uh, nice dualism between no absolute master, not fully fulfilling, but, and again here I think we can get more precise. Let's take Claude Lefort, right, who teaches us that the whole idea of liberal democracy, formal democracy, is to believe that place of the master, the, 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 the specifically totalitarian master that fully embodies the will of the, the people vacant. And now what we see today is a move around that space, but we still are not seeing that space closing. And I think again, this to your good point about uh, the problem of the warnings, you know, part of the effect of us seeing fascism is that people look around and Where's the, you know where's the where's the fascism where's the the brown shirts where's that there's something else going on that specifically utilizes it not being fascism as a way of being um, so that, that that these are I don't know if I made a lot of sense with the last no no you you made perfect sense but I don't know if the question to refer to this is lipstick or not <laughs> sorry <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, I've read uh, your fine paper in Slovene on the, these vagaries of uh, new masters, and it inspired me a lot. And uh, in my way, the problem is that what was uh, previously seen as obscene is now on the scene, on the very scene. And this shift uh, was taking four decades, three decades, you know, it goes along with the, the rise of the... Um, pornography becoming uh, pop uh, and other things as well. And one should include also that it is uh, really effective to fight political correctness the way Trump does. I'm sorry. I mean, it's very easy to do, to do so. And uh, in Slovenia, we have similar cases. Uh, for instance, our uh, main right politician, Janša, he's He's not stupid in a way. He's not mean, he's a coward, but he's, he knows some techniques how to unsettle, how to put people from the balance, etc. And he's very effective in that way. So um, part of the problem also lies in the fact that, uh, that uh, capitalism itself, the, uh, the changes in uh, contemporary capitalism from the 60s on go in the direction of valor valorization of the affect. This is the thesis of Brian Matsumi. And uh, when you valorize the, the affect, the affects, it does not count whether these affects are good or bad, are, uh, are destructive for the community or not. And this is the process which is... Uh, which is effectively used by new social, uh, you know, media, etc., etc. So, this is one thing. Um, people are simply uh, interested in bizarre things, which I don't know how to uh, how to uh, explain. In the way, this is pure hu natural human curiosity in one way, uh, uh, perversity on the other, and at the same time, there's also this. Uh, uh, trends of uh, relating to humans, not to machines. So somebody is human because he's fallible, because he's, I don't know, he left his wife or whatever, you know. So this is just human, and we are interested in these affairs. So uh, because one of the effects uh, tele television has on, on people is that when watching reality shows, you say, come on, 
We are not so bad. Huh? All the problems we have, how are we? Look at them, look at these crazy people. I mean, this is the effect, you know. Uh, this is uh, uh, considering your first question. And the second, I, I prepared some parts uh, speaking about Hegel's optimism. This optimism concerns also the master, and it concerns also the optimism spread in a critical theory. Critical theory presupposes that master is somehow castrated. So uh, the castrated master means that, in a way, if I may put so, master knows where he is his place. And what do we do when we have a master like Trump who doesn't want to obey, as Friedrich uh, William III would say? He doesn't want to uh, follow the democratic or whatever procedures. So that's, the, that's our predicament now. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Uh, this is an extension of what Eric said. He pretty much uh, made the point I wanted to make um, that you're focusing on certain political figures who yes. are ridiculous in the first place, and they seem to be the people in authority right now. So we can conflate master with with ridiculous master. But I I question that conflation. It's almost as though you're presupposing that the master is ridiculous, right? So, yeah. right, if you look at just the figures that you're thinking about, obviously then the master becomes ridiculous. But your talk also uh, refers to optimism in Hegel about some kind of master, and even Lacan, you mentioned. Precisely my point. Right, so, um, okay, I see it as a, a tension in your talk. Is there... Okay. Is there the possibility of a true master or not, would be my question. And I do think um, we all do uh, hold up certain figures in critical theory. In, when critical theory points out that the master is castrated, <laughs> it's doing that in a way from a, a position of, ma of the master. Yeah, yeah, I, I absolutely okay. agree. I absolutely agree. Uh, I left aside one thing of... Uh, you're right, I, there is a tension. I focused my, perhaps too much on the figure who are clowns, buffoons, etc. There's another side. There's a side when the master is really a master, and that's the authoritarian masters like, I don't know, Putin, Erdogan, etc. Oh, I, and, I, didn't have, I didn't have those. I was thinking of a, a, and, and a positive are, figure. Not yeah, yeah, a ah, positive figure. <laughs> That's what we're trying to do. I mean, finding a positive figure of but the we master. But would, we wouldn't call, most of us would not call Zelensky a ridiculous master at this point. No. I could mention a few other people that would probably be controversial to some people, like Pope, Pope Francis. Is he, is he a ridiculous master? No. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. There are, I, I didn't say that all new masters are, are ridiculous or that all contemporary political leaders are ridiculous. I didn't say that. Mm -hmm. I mean that, uh, I don't know, uh, let's take, maybe I will just uh, jump in the hole. Let's <laughs> take Finnish, uh, Finnish uh, uh, pre Premier, uh, what's she called? But it, She's I'm not ridiculous. interrupt while you're thinking, I mean, but... Yeah, she's if, not ridiculous. She's just a politician of new kind. So, yeah. But the the tension has to do with whether we think uh, there's a big other or not. Uh, we think that there is no, that the the big other does not exist, and yet I mm -hmm. do think that it it does, and it has effects, and uh, maybe uh, maybe these effects are more powerful now than ever. That we are, that the big other is quite strong in our society, I would say. Thank you. One quick last question, Andrew, and then we have to wrap up this afternoon. Yeah. Thank you so much, Peter. That was amazing, and I, I enjoyed every bit of it. I just wanted to, on this question of ridiculousness, um, I think that's the problem, is not to come in Adorno, the, the quote I quoted from Adorno at the end about clowning around has a little section on how intellectuals come in and scoff at what common folk think is, is awesome or is you know, yeah. enjoyable or is serious. And to the intellectual, that looks ridiculous. And so the category of ridiculousness obviously is something that we ought to question, but I think the burden of interpretation in this here is to try to understand 
that how it's not ridiculous. Don't let seeing it as ridiculous as it should be our last impulse. It's to ask, what does it take to to get into that? To have that be inspiring? To have that be actually serious? And then we complete the circle of how the joke is both funny and not funny, right? Comedy that is deeply serious. And just to to add this to the anecdote, um, when you look at especially in the sort of examples of the United States where you'll see a pickup truck with like five Trump flags on the back and then another five Confederate flags. And that imagery is being exported. Like people fly Confederate, because in Germany, you obviously famously cannot fly the Nazi flag or symbolism or any of that sort, but there's Confederate flags. When Trump went to Poland, for instance, to speak, there were people waving Southern American Confederate flags, which is, you know, or showing up in anti-immigrant you know, events and protests with Confederate flags. And it's sort of, what is it about the aesthetic of the flag? I mean, there's something I feel like in that uh, regalia that we find ridiculous that is obviously deadly serious, but requires the interpretive um, maneuver or skill to understand why. Yeah. Uh, there's a book of uh, Mark uh, Tevelite, Mener Fantasien, uh, Male Fantasies, which goes at the beginning of the 20th century, and there's many many uh, these symbols like flags, etc., how they function in between males, etc. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, I, thank you, Peter, very much. <laughs>